official World Space Week podcast. I'm Elf. And I'm Haritina Mogoshanu, Manager Educational Relations for World Space Week Association. We've decided to put together a series of podcasts um, extolling the virtues of everything that is space, covering everything from the birth and death of stars to the very edges of the universe. Our guest today is Dr. Melanie Johnston Hollett, Chair of the New Zealand Square Kilometre Array Research and Development Consortium, a member of the International Founding Board of SKA. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Johnston Hollett, what is it about the current progress in space exploration that makes us willing to celebrate the World Space Week? Well, I think exploration of space in all its forms, from actually putting a man on the moon to doing astronomy like I do, inspires people of all generations. So people, you know, throughout history have looked up at the stars and they've got really excited. So I think that's really what we're about in celebrating Space Week. This is great. And how is the uh, Square Kilometre Array celebrating the World Space Week? Uh, well, the Square Kilometre Array is celebrating by continuing to progress the Square Kilometre Array project at the international level. Um, we've just had the two uh, candidate sites submit bids, or well, not bids, I should say, site selection documents um, regarding the project. So this has been a huge effort in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we had 47 agencies involved in that process. So we're um, moving forward and hopefully we're going to make a decision early in the next year. So we're celebrating by uh, progressing work towards discoveries with the SKA once it gets built. This is great. For our listeners throughout the world, would you like to um, give us a little bit more detail of what the Square Kilometre Array represents? Sure. So the Square Kilometre Array is a transformational radio astronomy project. Uh, it's a project which is being built by an international consortium of nine countries which have signed up in April to something called the International SKA Founding Board, um, representing some 70 institutions across the world. Uh, New Zealand is one of those countries, along with Australia, South Africa, China, uh, France, Italy, the UK, the Netherlands, I think that's it, and there's a few others who will likely come on board in the near future. So the SKA project itself is uh, where we're going to take a large number of antennas, in this case 3,000, and we're going to distribute them across a continent size area. And what this will allow us to do is we will produce a radio telescope which is 50 times more sensitive than anything that we currently have. And it'll be, it'll be huge in terms of science. It'll open up an enormous discovery space that we are currently unable to access. So why is it called the Square Kilometre Array? Yeah, people always ask this. Um, so, if you took the surface of the dishes and you added it up, it would add up to one square kilometre. So it's not that we're going to put all the arrays in a square kilometre, we're going to distribute them across, you know, many thousands of kilometres, but the surface area would be one square kilometre. So it's a square kilometre of collecting area. And what's the point of having so many different telescopes arrayed over such a large area? Why can't you just put them all together or build one really, really big one? We can't build one really, really big one because you'd have to steer it and that'd be tricky. So you have to, <laughs> you know, be limited by the engineering there. You could build a smaller number of larger ones. So we're trying to build, you know, a large number of small dishes. You could have gone the other way, but uh, we decided early on that we would rather put our money in computing than we would put it into steel. So we thought this was more economical. Um, and the reason you distribute them over such a huge area is that the resolution of your instrument actually goes as the um, distance between your most uh, separated elements. So the further apart you put them, the better resolution you get. So you need many dishes to collect many photons and get more sensitivity, and you need them to be a large distance apart to get high resolution. Awesome. So a as a professional radio astronomer, what would a tool like the SKA actually allow you to do that you can't do with current telescopes today? Oh, God, loads of things. So the SKA... Um, will allow us to do a huge amount of science. We actually produced a science book back in uh, 2004, which is a huge, big, thick thing. Uh, it's full of loads and loads of cool science. Um, the project picked three key science topics to uh, explore. So these are things like trying to find when the first stars and galaxies were formed in the universe, um, understanding the three-dimensional structure of you know, the universe through mapping... Uh, the position of galaxies through th something called neutral hydrogen, which is a spectral line in the radio. Do a very detailed um, test of Einstein's theory of general relativity. 
So um, this is something that we can't do with any other type of instrument. We're going to look at pulsars, which are rapidly spinning um, stars, and they're excellent clocks. And if you look at a network of pulsars across the sky, then you can do very, very precise tests of uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity. So we're going to do that. We're going to look at the history of cosmic magnetism. And magnetism is something that you can't study without using radio telescopes. And the SKA is a superb instrument which is going to allow us to study magnetism um, to the edges of the universe. Because like right now, we're uh, very limited in what we can do due to this lack of sensitivity. It's quite hard to uh, get a decent um, number of measurements to be able to probe the magnetic field of, say, galaxies or clusters or even our own Milky Way. So these are the sorts of things that the SKA will be able to do that we just simply cannot do now. How much further back in time uh, will SKA allow us to see? Yeah, this is a difficult question for radio astronomy. Um, so one of the things that I've just mentioned is I've talked about trying to find out when the first stars and galaxies formed. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to do an experiment to detect something called the Epoch of Reionization. And uh, <laughs> someone... Can you say that once more, slowly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Epoch of reionization. Somebody said to me today that that should never be mentioned by astronomers because it's a terrible phrase that doesn't convey any meaning. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's a reasonable point. Um, so what we're going to try and do is we're going to look for when the first stars and galaxies formed in the universe, um, they emitted radiation which caused the hydrogen gas there to, to ionize. And this gives rise to a patchy signal um, in the radio from a spectral line of neutral hydrogen, which is at four, 14, 20 megahertz, but it gets redshifted to somewhere else in the radio band. And so if you look at how this patchy signal evolves, if you can detect it, then you can see where the first stars and galaxies formed. So this, we think, happened somewhere between 400 and 700 million years after the Big Bang. So we can certainly go back that far. If you're just looking at different types of radio emission, like radio synchrotron emission, which is where you've got um, electrons traveling very close to the speed of light spiraling in a magnetic field, which is the vast majority of radio signals that we detect. At the moment, there's no uh, spectral feature to classify how far away those things are. So we can detect these objects and they are potentially as far away um, you know, as these things first formed. But with the radio alone, we can't tell how far away that is. But with these spectral features, you can actually, from their recessional velocity and their change of frequency, you can work out how far away they are, so how old they are. So you mentioned that it was about um, within 400 to 500 million years yeah, of 400 the Big to Bang? 700, yeah, we don't know. So how long ago was the Big Bang, roughly? Uh, well, we think that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. So what we're doing is we're proposing to go back at least 13 billion years. So recently I went to a, a really cool talk of yours, actually, and you showed us a beautiful image of Centaurus A, um, one of the various deep, 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 deep sky objects. It's a galaxy near us, isn't it? Uh, Centaurus A is the nearest radio galaxy to us. Um, that particular image took 1,600 hours on the Australia Telescope Compact Array, and it was a team of people led by my collaborator Alana Fian in Australia, and we, I was on that team. And uh, yeah, we made this fantastic image. It's five times uh, more resolution than we've ever had of a radio galaxy. And so you can see all this kind of neat structure in the, in the lobes of the radio galaxy, which are emitted by this central massive black hole, which is really, really neat. Um, but the cool thing about the SK is objects like that and images like that will be produced routinely. We won't need to observe for 1,600 hours, and we certainly won't need to process the data for three years, which is what we had to do to be able to do this. So, um, yeah, it's an awesome, awesome picture, and hopefully we'll be able to make things like that all over the sky. So using something like the Square Kilometre Array and the associated computer, any idea how long that image would take to generate? It's pretty much instantaneous. So, I mean, the generation of the image might not be instantaneous, but the collection of that much data is pretty much instantaneous. So that's the kind of step up that we're talking about from the SKA to where we are now. You know, we're making a huge leap forward with this instrument. And the, the radio astronomy is only part of the some of the problems, I guess, that are associated with building the SKA, right? Like you've got yeah. a whole data collection problem as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So the radio astronomy bit's actually the easy bit. The How you deal with the amount of data that we're going to get from the SKA is really the big question. So the SKA will actually collect more data in the first uh, day of operation than we have on the internet now. So it's an exascale machine. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone laughs when they hear this. Um, and you have to realize that we've got 3,000 antennas potentially spread over 
you know, 5,000 kilometres if you build the telescope in Australia and New Zealand, and you have to transport that data back to a central supercomputer, which is going to process it and do what we call correlation. And so you've got a data transport problem. You have to have high-speed networks to be able to do this. You've got a massive computational problem because how do you actually deal with all of this information coming in? And then you've got a storage problem. So stuff comes out at a phenomenal rate, and how do you store it? And in fact... The way that we do radio astronomy at the moment is that we actually store all of the raw data and you can get it out of an archive and reprocess it yourself. With the SKA, that won't be possible, so we'll have to make images in real time and we'll have to keep the images. So this is a, a new regime. So yeah, there's a bunch of questions around that. And then there's also challenges around how do you keep your instrument radio quiet. If you're going to go to the effort of building such an instrument, you want it to actually not be spoilt by human noise. What so, does it mean? So, as optical astronomers worry about light pollution from cities, radio astronomers have exactly the same problem. Humans spew out huge amounts of interference, we call it, in the radio band. So you need to select a site which is what we call radio quiet. You need to be away from people, basically. Um... And you need to self-shield. So, of course, if you are dealing with electronics, electronics is going to produce um, noise in the radio band, and so it all has to be shielded. So your telescopes has to be um, put in ferret one of the telescopes, but the electronics has to be put in very low noise conditions, and you have to put you know, on-site computers in Faraday cages and this sort of thing. And plus, then you have the question of how do you power it all? So the SKA... Uh, is an instrument which requires power, which is not dissimilar to the Large Hadron Collider, which, as I understand it, is similar to the city of Geneva. So you've got this distributed power um, over thousands of kilometres with a central supercomputer, which requires about 60% of it. So we're talking, you know, something of the order of 100 megawatts. And you want to power this instrument for its lifetime, which is of the order of uh, 70 years, and it runs 24 hours a day. So... There's, there's a number of challenges, yeah. One of the cool things about astronomy and the um, kind of astro photo data and information we have at the moment is that a lot of it is freely accessible to people all over the world. Is this going to be the case with the SKA or are the countries that are involved with funding it and maintaining it and running it going to retain access rights to all of the data it collects? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So radio astronomy is historically um, open it's not like other parts of astronomy where your country has to buy 20% of a telescope and then your astronomers get 20% of the observing time or whatever. Radio astronomy has um, gone down a different path, and so radio telescopes are, are open access. If you're good enough to convince the Time Assignment Committee that your science is worth doing, you can have the time. So it's a very different uh, cultural philosophy in the radio astronomy community. So at the moment, we're building um, Pathfinder telescopes in Australia. Um, there's one being built called the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder ASCAP. And there'll be no proprietary period on that data. The teams that do the science will put it straight out there for other people to look at as soon as it's been uh, verified, which is a very different thing to these closed telescope consortia where countries buy in and then they keep proprietary data rates or not data rates but, but data rights I should say. Whether or not that happens with the SKA is is something that we have not yet discussed. Uh, that I think is a little way down the track but um, all I can say is historically radio astronomers have been very good at putting their data out there. Um, even when you've got proprietary periods on telescopes they're usually about 18 months and then your data goes into the public domain and you can reuse archival data um, radio astronomers also been pretty good at putting stuff into the virtual observatory, so I expect that there'll be some level of um, public accessibility, and this might be from you know 100% to something close to it.